we see as as a, a mechanism for change in in uh, mineral exploration and mining is the these international reporting codes and uh, what can be done there to generally improve um, what we now know as ESG performance, environmental, social and governance performance um, from companies on the ground undertaking these activities. John and I will be your hosts today. In fact, um, the clue's in the name really. It, be- it sort of it stands for innovative, non-invasive and fully acceptable exploration technologies. Um, over three years, um, a group of sort of partners from around Europe have been focusing on the technology. We've um, been looking at sort of drones, helicopters, all sorts of sort of innovative sort of geophysical techniques. But alongside that, in parallel, we've been focusing on the acceptability and what defines acceptability and what needs to be done for exploration to be acceptable within a European context. The project's focused Europe wide, but it has sort of sort of gone into sort of rabbit holes really or focused in on sort of three sort of sort of reference areas. One in Finland, one in Germany and one in Spain. In terms of acceptability, the barriers and challenges that we've found over the three years have been sort of fivefold. Um, existing land use comes up again and again and again whether that be uh, land use that's for recreation purposes or for agriculture or other industry. The negative perceptions of exploration and mining, um, that those have just grown throughout the project with the last year of the project, actually uh, not our project, but other EU projects sort of doing sort of similar sort of research, having sort of open letters written about them to the European Commission, complaining about sort of um, social aspects and the lack of engagement and complaining about exploration and mining in Europe. And this is quite pertinent and important really because it, you, for the first time in Europe, you've had networks of, um, of dissenters against mining range from sort of projects in Northern Ireland through to Finland, through to Romania, sort of working together and collaborating together to cohesively to complain against mining. And the cost of mineral exploration, this is also an important issue. Most of the mining in Europe is is not publicly listed. It tends to be sort of private sort of funding. Um, And that funding is hard to come by. And so the role of the resources and reporting codes within that is something which is, which is, I think is very relevant to the discussion today. Environmental concerns continue that they, they always have been and I think they always will be there. But European legislation, legislation um, is, is incredibly robust in terms of environmental concerns. And then governance processes. You, know, you have the EU legislation, but then you have subsidiarity and you have the national sort of legislation. And for the most of Europe, and in particular the most of the, the EU states, they are members of the, the OECD which means that what is known sort of in sort of other parts of the world as good international industry practice. From the social aspects of the project, so we've sort of focused in and sort of, we've pulled together sort of a vision for what is required for mining to be acceptable within a European context. And where the reporting codes sit is sort of really within that finance and industry sort of sector, sort of what is done, you know, what is their role actually in, in sort of was opening sort of gateways to finance. PERC is uh, Europe's very own um, reporting standard for mineral resources and reserves, um, last updated in 2017. And uh, it's uh, particularly good to have PERC here because um, uh, in the 2020 Crisco AGM, um, PERC was asked to uh, um, start to make progress or, t- or take the lead on producing um, a template, if you like, or, or a prototype for uh, new reporting codes, which include enhanced DSG um, reporting. When we're referring to CRISCO, that's the Committee for International Resource Reporting Standards, which is a grouping of 16 national bodies around the world, including the likes of JORC, and we've got KCMI and MPI GM on on this uh, panel here. At the CRISCO AGM last September, because we'd sort of started work on this, we, we were asked to sort of, if you like, 
go ahead with updating the PERC reporting standard to show one example of how uh, extra guidance could be incorporated. And uh, our, the first step in our update was to realign the PERC standard, with, which had been uh, last issued in 2017, with the 2019 Crisco template. And then we have kind of a list of things that have accumulated over the last four years. And obviously one of the important ones was environmental social governance. So, and with assistance from Catherine and Sarah and also uh, correspondence with uh, Teresa in South Africa, who was the, the lead, has really led the way with the SAM ESG guidelines, you know, so we're all, if you like, all the international bodies are kind of trying to learn from one another. And if you like, we, we kind of leapfrog along. So the idea would be when we issue the per reporting standard, before it can be adopted by PERC, it has to be shared anyway with the other national organizations. And, you know, there would be a chance for additional comment. We thought the opportunity came because the fact project finishing off, that we could have this international discussion now and share ideas and perhaps discuss one or two of the items we've come on that, you know, have, uh, well, are still under discussion, let's say, so we can take international input before deciding ourselves on in PERC on what we'll put in. The modifying factors in the codes, which if you like, are considerations that have to be taken into account when we consider sort of geologically what's in the ground, which we would refer to as the mineral resource, when we wish to convert that into what we could economically extract, which we would term mineral reserves or for the Australians or reserves. Um, but uh, that's where we would apply considerations like the, the prices and the costs and everything. And, and there have always been the concept that environmental, social and uh, legal and governance uh, governmental aspects would be part of the modified factor even though a lot of the european countries have historically had important mining industries the the current generation aren't as familiar with those and and uh, yeah so so the other change in the codes would be saying that you have to consider these aspects right from the exploration stage it's uh, you know that they're relevant uh, there all all of us in crisco and perk and i think jork you know most of us are doing this voluntarily on our own own time because uh, we're all volunteer run organizations and um, uh, perk as you see from the six there's six logos behind me we're we're a grouping of six professional organizations. A general question for everyone is, are you happy with figure one or do you think figure one should somehow indicate that you have to look at thing modified factors and in particular ESG before even reporting expiration results? When we're talking about our mineral resources and reserves, um, I mean, are these constrained to your stereotypical base and bulk metals or is it something which is broader than that? So what is the the scope of this and does PERC differ from any of the other standards and codes from around the world? There are a lot of the companies that have adopted the PERC standard are actually industrial mineral or cement uh, companies and that, that would differ say from Australasia and, uh, and uh, uh, Canada and uh, those changes initially introduced in the PERC standard have been incorporated if you look at the uh, 2019 Crisco template, you will see there's an appendix on, um, I don't remember the title exactly, but there's an appendix on industrial minerals and there's an appendix on dimension stone and they essentially have arisen from changes that initially came in the PERC standard and have, if you like, propagated upwards to the uh, uh, Crisco international reporting template. The one other change that we were going to make, which sort of arises from Catherine's presentation, was that uh, there should be reference to looking at modifying factors, particularly the environmental and social ones, right from the exploration stage onwards. From Canada, we've, we've got the uh, CIM, um, Canadian Institute for Metals and, Min and Mining. And so, uh, They've been working on uh, since about 2000, 2017 to produce um, environmental and social best practice guidelines. Um, it's still under revision. A well needed um, guidance on, on governance is really the focus. You have to have the governance to hit the environmental and social on the head. So I think it's really key that we get our heads around that and move that forward. Um, so we're going to back to principles and we're going to be pointing to all the great guidance that's already out there on environmental and social practices. I was mentored by the guy who created the phrase social license to operate. 
Um, and I don't know if he brainwashed me or indoctrinated me or drugged me or whatever, but uh, for 25 some odd years, um, sustainable development, CSR, um, ESG has been part of the mantra. And it's really refreshing and hopeful and enlightening to see so many people uh, focused on this. I think part of that indoctrination uh, was instilled an aspect of the governance and the importance of governance that relates to a certain hopeful degree of culture within our global mining industry and maybe one day a uh, global village. Um, the, the, the knowledge that we carry as an industry and avocational practitioners here as well, um, I think many of us might agree or disagree uh, perhaps as well is that our environmental knowledge has grown considerably. Uh, technical knowledge is, is really quite good. Um, there's cer certainly room for improvement. Um, social is the challenge. We included a section for it, uh, social and environmental, but it hasn't really been enforced and held uh, people being held to account for that. So even through the, the upgrades and the changes to 43101, including the last one in 2016, there's been a greater and greater focus on that. What was interesting is my involvement as an industry executive that greater focus actually came from the financing side and not so much the investment side. It was more on the loan because the banks really wanted to see some degree of security. If we consider corporate governance, that changes from owner to owner. Project governance is something that can be passed on to community to community and they have a degree of certainty because they're the ones who are in fact your greater risk and in that therefore should be a modifying factor. And in that aspect, time is a modifying factor as well. Because we, when we're looking at electric vehicles or whatever we want for um, economic or social or structural development in the world, our access to resources and that clock is an incredible factor as well. By increasing, um, having more of the ESG um, incorporated into all of our codes, that's definitely going to increase uh, public confidence. So we're looking to each other to, to get to a better end result. They have developed some ESG best practice guidelines in 2017. And uh, I think that uh, there's some really interesting conversations to come from CIM, particularly with, the, with uh, some of the feedback they've given on whether um, the G should be a separate part of the ESG. You know, we should have ES and then G. Um, I think that's a really important thing to discuss and uh, probably one of the areas under greatest debate at the moment. You know, should these reporting codes even be considering governance? Um, is it their place to do so? Uh, what even does governance mean? Are we talking about uh, national governance or corporate governance, previously known as CSR? You did ask about, you know, where do things like free prior and informed consent come in? You know, that's a very, very important question. It's a burning question here. Um, ideally, from uh, a First Nations or an Indigenous people's point of view, it happens at day one, and that's long before there are reserves and resources. That would be the day that the geologist first turns up on the project. For many uh, uh, on the corporate side, uh, this doesn't become, for them, a priority until they've got something in the ground, which is probably when the resources uh, start to become reserves and, and there is some reality. I say, well, when there's something real here, then we'll talk about it, we'll get serious. So there's a gap there. There's a gap that uh, is going to continue to be a, a very controversial part of the relationship of the mining industry to indigenous people. Certainly, I think in Europe here with the with the Green Deal, the Green Deal 2050, we're we're starting to feel a bit of pressure to um, see how exploration and mining can meet those objectives. And uh, time is not our friend, actually, if we're going to um, produce those uh, critical raw materials in a responsible and socially acceptable way. Um, we, we do need to get moving on um, the acceptability issue. So. Um, 
Jork has been doing some really interesting work. Jork is the um, um, it's a joint oil reserves committee in Australia, and I think uh, um, we're also represented here by uh, uh, IMM and the Australian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy. The last update of the Jork code was in 2012, so it's now eight years old. There's a few rust spots, you know, the the, the odometer's getting wound up a little bit. And where we are is we've just really started our engagement process with our stakeholders to get comments around areas to review, uh, suitability, concerns, etc. So I've launched an online survey in December. We will be reviewing that going back to stakeholders a number of times, setting up some working groups, but our intent is to have a new code by uh, the end of the year. The changing legislation uh, in Australia between perhaps uh, states and the federal government. They're not always aligned, um, but there is a tendency for reporting codes to become part of formalised processes. Um, the community consent process is, has changed remarkably um, you know, over the last 10 years. There's, again, there's no one model. Um, it's sometimes legislated, in fact, outside of the mining lease process. So it can be a completely separate government process uh, of reviews and the like. Environmental standards, like everywhere, they continue to evolve. And some of those get hard coded into legislation. Some of them aren't. So what's the right thing to be doing and where are the things there? And and last but not least, we tend to talk about ESG, but the, the changes to investor expectations. And this came out of the last session there, that, that actually really does mean about project financing too. So if you don't have those people happy, you can have all the rocks in the ground you like and you're nowhere. So last year, as a result of that work uh, and a forum we held in 2019, uh, OzIMM developed what's known as it's now its social responsibility statement. That statement um, is uh, refers to a framework. The framework includes the existing Royal Charter for OzIMM, its code of ethics, uh, now the public statement on social responsibility, and now the defined areas of practice competencies for environmental professionals and social performance professionals. We've had environmental performance professional uh, recognition for some time, but now social performance is in there as well. Our position is that at some point it will be necessary for people to sign off on ESG factors. Uh, in fact, it's already necessary for project financing in, in major projects that have Equator Bank financing or it's like some of the projects I've been in, IFC financing. So, you know, you already have to have people who know what they're talking about across a full suite of ESG matters. A very a brief um, a background about the uh, KCMI code. This is a quite uh, young code, even though that it was um, uh, introduced in 2011. It has been uh, updated uh, back in 2017. For your uh, reference as well, uh, that the um, uh, code is used uh, both by the publicly listed company and also by private uh, companies. The ESG aspect um, uh, within or inside the reporting uh, code, it's uh, something that uh, needs to be, you know, uh, uh, discussed uh, very um, um, uh, 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 deeply and intensively. Uh, all the reports to uh, the government uh, is now has to comply uh, with the um, uh, uh, KCMI uh, code. So this is uh, something that is not quite new, the ESG, but it is something that probably uh, can be a uh, new for uh, a company if it has to be uh, put inside the, uh, uh, the reporting uh, code. Um, I think uh, some of our colleagues uh, were mentioning about the modeling factor that's already covering the uh, environmental and also social. And for your information in Indonesia, that all the uh, project that has to go to the, uh, to the uh, uh, productions, uh, they have to pass not just the feasibility study from technical and economical um, um, uh, aspects, but also from environmental and social and some extent governance as well. 
Camera is the China Association of Mineral Resources Appraisers, um, and it's it, understand like it's still working towards joining Criscal and will likely get a Criscal template complaint code launched around the half uh, the, uh, the half two of this year 2021 so uh, very much looking forward and then to see how the uh, the board of camera is working on and uh, uh, to find out more about the detailed um, policies or regulations hopefully will be embedded especially for ESG because currently in the current uh, uh, the camera code there are very limited uh, terms actually clearly addressed for uh, ESG. There, there are definitely a few uh, terms regarding to environment, considering about like the MEE, the uh, Ministry of uh, Ecology and Environment. Uh, they do, uh, we, we do have these environment laws, and uh, for all the mining companies, uh, they have to apply uh, to to apply uh, the the mining license or uh, exploration license to uh, reaching the certain standards uh, under the environment law. Um, but uh, that's why there are more environmental terms in the current uh, mineral, uh, the camera code. But there are limited. There, there is also very limited, like a social uh, terms addressed in the current version. Um, and there is basically like no G <laughs> in the current code. As you may know, the China is uh, right now we have a new code, and for the Chinese mining uh, community or mining industry, we have the we always say we have the two markets. The one is the market inside of China is a very big demand, and another is international market. So uh, the first, the future of a plan for us, this is a very important. We need to add every geologist and all of the mining company to know the new code. So we published this new code already half a year. So in the next time, we need to really need, need to uh, do all the promoting for this new code really need to keep the balance for the uh, ESG as think uh, not only the environment but also the governments also the social uh, matters so we need to really urgent to call the international collaboration so this is uh, I think the second plan for for us I think the third is uh, in this year we are uh, planning for a new uh, international uh, meeting or summit uh, to make a new open door policy for the for the mining uh, community or mining uh, industries uh, to open to not only the uh, policymakers but also the uh, industry. So we need to in the same um, um, uh, community or same uh, platform to dialogue and to really to working together. To I'm on the site and um, I'm kind of waiting for um, the permission to uh, to get a drill permission from the social local social community. So that's the challenge. And then in here in Mongolia we have um, the um, exploration and uh, geology work. Even in uh, even mining is facing very difficulties from the social local uh, people. And, and as well as government. So uh, they, um, that's the thing um, I was thinking that uh, the Catherine uh, was uh, talking about anti-mining issue as well. So the uh, anti-mining, um, just uh, I heard uh, in Ulaanbaatar, there's a parliament member is actually making an anti-mining anti uh, the um, campaign I'm not talking about international things. International things, we all are talking about international good practices. But uh, the people in here, or maybe uh, everybody, needs um, the practice in their local area would would help help to understand. And um, that's a good thing. We're looking to remain relevant within the, the minerals industry. We're looking to assist our, our members, whether it be small junior companies, whether it be explorationists, whether they be large mining companies. We want to make everything relevant to, to people who are actually out there working in the field. We have our, our SAMES guideline, which as John mentioned, sort of became Part of officially part of the the, the Sam codes suite of, of codes in, in from 2017 
development of it started in about 2013, 2014. Um, and the, the guideline exists as a guideline because it provides clarity to CPs on, on how to go about integrating ESG into their reporting. What we're working on now is, is really saying at each, at each point along the value chain, what does it mean? What kind of information should you be accessing it? Um, in certain instances, where can you find that information um, that's, that's freely and publicly available to help you understand, for example, your, your environmental or social risks in more detail? And then how do you actually apply that? Because ultimately, SAMES is looking for integrated determination of resources and reserves. Um, and you can only do that by sort of distilling a huge amount of information that exists within the, the world of sustainability reporting and, and looking at it through the lens of mineral resource and reserve reporting. We, we haven't seen as much adoption of the SAMES guideline to the extent that we would like. And I do think part of that is because the guideline doesn't provide enough guidance. Um, you know, it sets out sort of what you want to see, but not necessarily how to go about doing it. We're also looking at the importance of providing guidance for other modifying factors and specifically the um, integrated risk management, something that we also feel um, is, is lacking in many of the codes and has a great deal to do with information recovered from the, the ESG uh, factors. Another thing that we're very uh, we're concentrating on is how to sensitize our competent persons to the importance of, of ESG. Uh, we want people to comply with ESG, not simply because it's the right thing to do or because somebody has a big stick, but rather because it's something that they believe ought to be reported on in a responsible and sensible manner. They have a relatively new um, regulation, uh, which was formally adopted in 2000, February 2019. Um, it's known as SK1300, uh, the Modernization of Property Disclosures for Mining Registrants. Um, now, the, a big difference here compared to uh, some of the other codes that are uh, joining us today is that uh, while, whilst those are codes or, or guidance uh, instruments, um, SK1300 is a law um, which is enforced by the US uh, Security Exchange Commission. In 2018, in fact, it was the SEC passed the new disclosure standards, but they didn't actually get promulgated across into the Federal Register until early 2019. And so they became law and binding on all mining exploration companies as of 1st of January this year. And that actually is now law that the US and foreign registrants listed on, US, on the various US exchanges have to follow when undertaking mining disclosures to the public. So much of what's covered in the new regulation is said by the SEC to be Crisco compliant, but there's also a number of topics of particular interest to the SEC themselves that they've woven in and out and throughout the SEC guidelines. So for nearly 40 years, the US used a, a code called Industry Guide 7. 7, it was fairly simplistic. It was a guideline. It actually wasn't binding. It was just simply the SEC asked you to do it. They would point to that particular document and they would expect you to follow. With SK1300's promulgation, now we have a law. Um, the document itself is about 400 pages, of which about the first 300 discusses the reasoning why the SEC came down on certain decisions and certain methods of presentation. And about 20 pages of it actually is what is required to actually comply with public disclosures in certain areas and there's about another two pages that actually cover the content requirements of what's called a technical report summary which is the SEC's um, version of a technical report under NR43-101. Was that ESG disclosure is still voluntary in the US for all industries other than mining but there's a lot more pressure to have these types of disclosures from institutional investors so I'm expecting to see that as more of these technical report summaries come out in, into the public domain that you'll see pressure coming on to other aspects within the United States to start conforming and, and bring themselves in line with what's required of the mining companies. Governance is a system in place to maintain the integrity of a process. And when it comes to the, the SEC's new standard, the SK1300, they're talking about the process of mineral exploration, mineral resource estimation, mineral reserve estimation. Those are the processes they're referring to. And they wanna see internal controls over the process, which means a governance system. And that means you have procedures in place, you have uh, checks in the system, you have oversight. 
And this also feeds back into civil liability defense, that if you have a good control, internal controls over your, your process, then you can show that as one of your due diligences. And even under the Canadian and, and parts of the US law, that gives you another defense that you have a disclosure con control procedure in place The question always arises whether uh, Crisco is a leader or a follower. In this particular case, it has to be a follower and it takes the best from each individual code as they are revised. Just listening to this morning and, um, and uh, to, to this evening's discussions, I think one of the most important things for me which we need to address is uh, the definition of governance, project governance, we've got corporate governance, we've got social governance, which is in the, in the template at the moment. So I think we need to just define what exactly we're talking about. BlackRock are ingraining ESG more and more and more into uh, the uh, their processes of investment across their entire diverse range of, of, of investment uh, themes. And specifically within the mining space, they understand that mining can add huge value to the world. The impact that this could have on the mining industry uh, driven by the investment world. Um, I have spoken to lots of ESG related funds and impact investors. Almost exclusively, they do not uh, uh, they do not invest in mining. Some of them are not allowed to, some of them are allowed to, but choose not to. So the huge tidal wave of money that has gone into these investment themes in the last, uh, the last, well, particularly the last uh, 24 months, but uh, wide, longer than that, is basically like a jet stream going above the industry. We are being completely ignored by huge new uh, uh, pools of capital. And I think that sort of context driven approach is really crucial, particularly with this ESG um, topic. You can standardize mineral reporting, but this is going to be a much bigger challenge to, to, um, uh, to, to come to a consensus with. But it's great to see that the willingness is there and there's a real um, desire from everybody that's here today to, co to collaborate internationally. You know, speaking as a geologist and, and uh, as an economic geologist, um, understanding how the ESG translates into modifying factors for, for mineral resources and reserves is, is going to be a really interesting area of development. Acknowledgement that the earlier you start pulling ESG into this in a meaningful way, the better. We've heard this as we've gone around the world, depending on the jurisdiction and where the codes or standards sit relative to governmental governance, as it were, just to use all the words, um, what is or is not really possible in terms of bringing something that is dynamic and ever evolving, such as the social side. The social issues, the social understanding, the social context, having effective stakeholder engagement from the outset should be seen as an investment rather than a cost. 2021 is actually a, an incredibly exciting year. What we've heard just now is that almost everybody is updating their code or standard or guidance right now. So there's an amazing push that's coming from our end. Also, as we can see from the international expectations perspective, there is that increasing need and desire to go from the greenwashing, as one of our attendees has just said, into true impact and action. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so, so much for your participation today.